Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome back to day two of the Borlaug Dialogue. It's great to see everyone today. We have a very packed morning, so we're going to jump right into it with a uh, uh, first panel that we've all been anticipating. So last night was the big fifth anniversary celebration of our Borlaug um, Award for Field Research and Application endowed by the Rockefeller. And, uh, Many of you were probably there, so this panel today, we're um, so pleased to have four of our recipients with us. And so I'm going to now invite to the stage um, Dr. Bram Govertz, the 2014 award recipient. And Bram is the strategy lead for sustainable intensification in Latin America at CIMIT. Um, Dr. Charity Mutegi, who is the 2013 recipient in Dr. Mutegi is the East Africa Coordinator for the AFLASAFE Project for the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Mr. Eric Pullman, our 2015 recipient, who is the Rwanda Country Director and Senior Partner at One Acre Fund. And Dr. Andrew Mude, who joined these individuals last night as he was awarded the prize. He is a Senior Economist at the International Livestock Research Institute. So we're very honored to have a, a special guest chairing this session with these four award winners today. And as all of you know, one of Norm's goals was to inspire the next generation. And he inspired so many others who have been in our, who have been in our World Food Prize youth institutes around the world, including myself. And so with that, it is my great privilege to introduce someone who is doing just that. And with that, introducing Dr. Judith Roden, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Thank you so much, Catherine, and for all of your accomplishments um, at a young age as well and, and for your terrific future. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this, what will be a wonderful conversation with the Borlaug Field Award recipients. Five years ago during the World Food Prize ceremony in 2011, I had the great pleasure of announcing that the Rockefeller Foundation was committing a million dollars to endow this award that of course carries the name of one of my great predecessors, Norman Borlaug. I was privileged to get to know Norm just a bit and spend some time with him in the final years of his life after I had become president of Rockefeller. Of course, when I met him, he had already been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the Congressional Gold Medal. His name had become synonymous with the Green Revolution of the mid-20th century. And yet, in our conversations, instead of ever focusing on his accomplishments, or indeed even focusing on the past, um, he was single-mindedly concerned with the future. One of his most important po personal goals in his later years was ensuring that future generations had role models, innovators, and scientists who would continue the hard work of securing the global food supply. I think Norman Borlaug would have been very proud of the men and women who have earned this award bearing his name. The Borlaug Field Award recipients represent four different continents, and their disciplines and accomplishments are just as varied. Their subjects range from plant diseases to agricultural technology to livestock insurance. They come from di different backgrounds, they have different approaches, and they have found different solutions but they all share the same qualities that Norman Borlaug embodied, innovation, persistence, and a dogged dedication to saving lives through science and technology. They were all also uh, given the award under the age of 40. In fact, we made that one of the criteria because we believed that our winners would have long and distinguished careers ahead of them. And one of their greatest gifts to the world will be demonstrating the importance of this work to others, just as Norman Borlaug did. In the 1940s, the Rockefeller Foundation financed his original trip to Mexico. 
and the wheat developed there catalyzed a green revolution across Latin America and Asia. A decade ago, we helped launch the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa to, to really advance and replicate that success for the African continent. And five years ago, we established this award as a way of honoring those who are on the fr front lines of the fight to eliminate global hunger. And just like our investment in Norman Borlaug's original expedition to Mes Mexico, it is an investment in people and ideas that will change the world. I am delighted to share the stage and begin this conversation with, the four, with four of the five outstanding recipients of the Borlaug Field Award. So let's begin our conversation. And I've encouraged them to jump in. I will ask each of them a first question. Um, but my goal here is really to encourage conversation among them. Um, and uh, please, as I said, jump in. Don't feel it's rude. Uh, let's really get a conversation going. Um, let me start with you, though, Charity, um, because your work in protecting staple crops from aflatoxin outbreaks is very significant. And of course, you, you were awarded the uh, 2013 prize for that work. Do you think since then, since 2013, let's use that as, as the starting point, the global agricultural landscape has changed in some fundamental way that recognizes the importance of aflatoxin outbreaks as a threat to our food supply? And if so, could you, could you really comment on how? Indeed, thank you, Judith. Uh, for the sake of everybody, let me just sum up and say this. Uh, aflatoxin is what I like to say is an agricultural problem with serious health consequences and of course trade. Uh, of course, you know about immune suppression, stunting, uh, um, affecting trade between the, uh, the African countries and the EU countries. So we've really suffered uh, with the aflatoxin scourge. Since 2013, a lot has happened, uh, not just because of this award, but there are very many initiatives uh, and recognition by governments to take this as a serious problem. Remember, it's affecting a key staple. Uh, for example, uh, in West Africa, ECOWAS, has recently ratified an aflatoxin action plan. It has actually been ratified by the Council of Ministers. Uh, COMESA, uh, the common markets for East and Southern Africa, is taking a lot of interest in addressing the issue of aflatoxin standards and trade, and has a lot of, uh, had a lot of support uh, from the USDA FAS um, uh, uh, side. The East African community uh, is actually currently developing policy that will enable some of these technologies that we are developing find a, a landing point because there's no use of developing technology, but because there are no supporting mechanisms, for example, policy, infrastructure, that help us move this technology from the benches to the farmer who needs it. So there's a lot, of, there's, there's a lot that is happening. Within individual governments in, uh, in, uh, in many countries, Kenya, for example, uh, is mainstreaming, is including aflatoxin issues in the strategic plan by the Ministry of Agriculture. National programs uh, like the Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization has put a serious commitment into addressing post-harvest issues, including pre-harvest. I mean, uh, aflatoxin is both a pre-harvest and post-harvest problem. The CG centers are doing so much. I mean, for a long time, issues to do with uh, nutrition and health were not really in the forefront. But at the moment, the CG has a whole uh, research program dedicated to nutrition and health. And that is where the aspects of aflatoxin and other related issues uh, fall into place. So they're getting a lot of limelight uh, and the problem, but as well as a solution, is being given the attention it so deserves. Yeah. Um, let's, you mentioned new technologies that are coming onto the fore that really are, are part of the armamentarium of the fight against aflatoxin. And Bram, you've worked in so many countries and really focused in part in your work on 
technology, in this case, uh, mechanization or the lack of mechanization, um, which clearly, as you say, uh, contributes to low productivity in developing countries. Can you share then with us, again, as, as you're looking now currently and into the future, um, successful and innovative models um, in mechanization and the use of technology in making a difference to farming communities globally? Yeah, of course, thank you. Thank you, Judith, and thank you for the invitation. And again, thanks also for the Rockefeller Foundation for their vision, because 50 years ago, uh, it's thanks to you guys that Norman Borlaug started CIMIT, so thanks a lot for that. And I think uh, having successful models is actually what is shown here, uh, here on the stage, because if you look at the, at the different uh, elements that are represented, the innovation uh, comes with the uh, alpha toxin uh, work, but uh, also the work you're doing of uh, reducing the risk uh, with risk-prone uh, farmers and that is uh, key. Uh, uh, farmers are uh, trying to take decisions and trying to make innovations and harvest innovations within a very high uh, risk uh, environment. And it's also within that that we need to make sure that those innovations get scaled so that we actually connect the research which uh, the CG centers here represent that somehow represent and that it gets connected to organizations like the one you uh, successfully uh, lead, uh, Eric, so that we actually can set up innovation networks where farmers become connected one between the other and we harvest the, the inherent need for change that uh, every uh, smallholder farmer or, or lead smallholder farmers have. So in a sense also trying to get that information back when we scale out that technology and use that new information to generate be better decision making and decision taking. And specifically the example of mechanization you asked me about within, uh, within the project we have in Mexico called Masagro, the take it to the farmer component. Uh, what has been generated is let's say a pre-competitive space in which local uh, blacksmiths and local workshops are working together to innovate farmer demand driven uh, innovation for machinery and that actually made a complete change because it ended up that farmers request uh, machines that are very flexible, that are multi-crop and multi-use, because they need to use it in very different situations. And by innovating and generating those multi-crop and multi-use, it can, it can do various uh, operations with the same machine. We, you also open the possibility to generate service provision. So why not look at, let's say, an Uber for, uh, for machinery for smallholder farmers instead of asking farmers to buy a machine and use that same machine with sensors and information connection as an information point that can send back information to the cloud and can support decision making and decision taking tools. I am, uh, we are convinced that it's more and more important that we work as a whole team here uh, to turn data into information, information into decision making decision-making into decision-taking, and then decision-taking into application. If a farmer doesn't have the way to plan a scenario, to say I have five dollars, five pesos, five rupees, where am I gonna invest it? Is it gonna be in a machine? Is it gonna be in seed? Is it gonna be in education of my child? What are the different scenarios the farmer can invest in so that he makes uh, the best decision? But also how can we generate uh, successful platforms for public-private partnerships. And another example of that is the work we do with the seed companies. In a sense, uh, Artur is here represented and he's leading that work uh, in the Masagro project where the R&D is done in the public sector, but it is given together with capacity building through uh, local national seed companies that again work together in a pre-competitive space, but then they go out to the farmer, they offer those products and they dif differentiate through service through helping the farmer to make the right decision to incorporate the seed with the machine. And obviously in the middle, there is the agronomic system practice. And then around that, we need the right decision making. You know, we talk so much at the top levels about data-driven decision making. And what you're saying is at the very grassroots level, enabling data-driven decision making Absolutely. produces so much uh, more effective outcomes. And uh, Absolutely. That is a really critical point, I think, uh, as, as we go towards the benefit of technology um, and the future opportunities. Uh, Andrew, you've used a different kind of technology approach, but also harnessing the use of technology for the benefit of farmers, pastoralists in your case uh, thus far. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the technological innovations that you see critical 
to your approach and how effective they've been really for pastoralists in, in, in a very transformational way? Uh, thanks, thanks, Judith, for that question. Um, yeah, technology has been central to the work we do in a lot of different um, areas. So, for example, um, uh, uh, the type of insurance uh, that we are providing and that is required in these kind of uh, systems uh, in pastoral areas uh, that we work uh, is, uh, is one that requires a, a specific type of innovation in insurance, uh, which we call index-based. And so uh, the application of it in this area has used satellites uh, that read the, the, the amount of vegetation on the ground um, um, over time and space. Very, it's freely available satellite data um, that is high resolution. Um, and this is what uh, uh, the satellite data provides, the, uh, gives a reading of the state of health of the rangelands. And because in these systems, livestock really, the health of livestock is primarily due to the amount of forage that's available, it creates a great link and a great predictor of, uh, of, of livestock health and, 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 and mortality. And, and uh, however, uh, satellite, uh, the reading of the satellite, for example, there's a challenge there in the sense that the satellite tells you just how much green, how much ve vegetative uh, uh, um, uh, vigor there is on the ground, but it doesn't tell you how nutritious that green is, um, how palatable is it for livestock. And when you have circumstances in some areas, you have invasive species that are, are coming on that uh, appear to be green, but are not very palatable. And so one question is, how do we deal with this? And we can deal with this with uh, you know, econometric techniques, with techniques in remote sensing, but it only takes us so far. And so um, one of the, the, the new, uh, uh, technological possibilities that we are investigating along with our colleagues at Cornell University is, uh, is trying to leverage the fact that in these areas, um, pastoralists themselves, first of all, network, cell phone network coverage is, uh, is, is getting to be uh, uh, fully available. The density in these areas is increasing. Pastoralists themselves are, are using smartphones, basic smartphones, but they're able to use it. So we have initiated a process where we're trying to see if we could get them to crowd if we could crowdsource uh, ground truthing by, by developing applications in which pastoralists take pictures in certain areas, they're incentivized to take pictures by providing them you know, a, a small 10 shillings, about uh, 10 cents um, now for every picture they take. If you want them to go into areas where you don't have that much information, you pay them a little bit more, and our research shows that they respond to these incentives. So in the space of about, in a, in a uh, pilot we did last year, in the space of about um, five months, 120 pastoralists, and uh, most of these were illiterate pastoralists, but you know, they're able to use their phones. They sent about 120,000 photos up into, the, uh, up into the cloud. And so working together with Cornell's Institute of Computational Sustainability, they're looking at this. Each picture was taken with, um, with some information, and so they're trying to use big data analytics and so on to provide a filter that will able to tell us, well, this green we're seeing, um, how good is it for livestock? For what livestock is it better? And that will help us, for example, increase the precision of, uh, of, of, of the index contracts. And one of the fundamental requirements of a successful index insurance program um, to go to scale is that the, the, the contract is actually um, ensuring the risk that you're trying to cover. Um, there have been many instances. Um, index insurance uh, has been around for about 20 years, and it has received um, a bit of a bad rap in some instances because uh, when, um, when, when the, uh, um, the providers have not been very careful about how they design, there's a lot of backlash. And so we are seeing that uh, um, in some countries where um, you know, farmers were up in arms and the government supported them against organizations that might have uh, um, uh, um, uh, provided contracts that were not so carefully designed, we find that they completely, in a sense, throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so in, this, in these areas, uh, farmers now do not have the benefit of this uh, you know, important technology to carry out the risk that they face, which is, you know, which is really uh, damper to their, investment, to their incentives to invest in, you know, if it's crop farmers, to invest in um, hybrid seed, to invest in good fertilizer and so on and so forth. If I may, another area that uh, we're really getting into um, um, with regards to technology is, is training. Um, one thing that is important, not just for, for herders and insurance, but for you know, a lot of the technologies that we're all working, is to make sure that uh, um, uh, the, the constituents that we are serving or we are providing these technologies to really understand what it is they're getting.
It's important to build their trust so you can create adoption. Um, but the, the cost of extension, of providing learning to the farmer or to the, uh, um, to the agent, let's say in our case the insurance agent or the extension agent, is extremely costly. You have groups of scientists or you know, development practitioners who go out, they, you know, they, train, uh, uh, they, they train the farmers or their representatives, they leave, and a lot of work in um, instructional design or education are shown that that's not the best way for people to learn. But now the fact that people are, you know, most people are using smartphones, for example, there is work in uh, nexus of instructional design and, um, and uh, mobile learning, which can um, utilize uh, various techniques, uh, gamification, game-based uh, um, game learning. And we have done a small pilot with one of our insurance companies where we gave a subset of their agents um, um, a small mobile-based learning um, uh, tool that we developed. And we find that uh, um, relative to the normal um, methods of providing extension, agents who receive that um, improve their comprehension twice over and also their sales of insurance about um, three times over. I think it's still early, but these are applications that have benefits way beyond insurance. This is a wonderful. Thank you so much for those examples. Um, Eric, the One Acre Fund is a system-based model. It really tries to attack and integrate uh, an approach to uh, uh, helping farmers increase their outcomes, be more productive, be more successful, um, and use all of the resources available. Some people might be familiar with it, but can you describe the model and, and um, how you've used it both in Rwanda and of course across East Africa? Sure, thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, and with such an esteemed panel. Um, it's awesome and it's inspiring for me to see uh, so many cool innovations really getting out to farmers. Uh, yesterday there was, a, there was also an amazing panel that uh, Sir Gordon Conway led and I thought it was quite fitting that there is a knight, a doctor, an ambassador, and it was the farmer who stole the show. Um, and Monica, that farmer expressed a problem that is exactly what One Acre Fund is trying to solve. She said, I need striga resistant seed. I need some reliable source of fertilizer. Um, I wouldn't mind a training or two. And it should frustrate this room that that is still being expressed on this stage. It comes down to delivery, delivery, delivery. How do we get those things? There, there are amazing minds and geniuses here, people who spent 30 years breeding striker resistant seed here in the audience, fantastic minds. And the challenge is how do we get it out to farmers in certain areas? We've done a great job in, 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 different, in different areas. Um, so what One Acre Fund tries to do is, is exactly that. We, we package together a service bundle that includes delivery. So an amazing logistics team and field officers and teams that get these physical inputs out to areas where they haven't gone before. Um, we understand that farmers need financing. They don't always have money at the beginning of the season to pay for these services. So we provide credit for 9 to 12 months where farmers can pay slowly um, to access that. We bundle that in a training. So we, we you know, Sending out a technology without how to use it is, is stupid and dangerous and not really a good idea. So um, you have to bundle that with technology. If people don't know how to use an improved seed or how to plant it or properly space it, they're, waste, they're just throwing money away. So um, we train farmers every two weeks on different practices throughout the season. We have an amazing team of 2,500 field officers who are from the communities that they work in that are there guiding farmers along the way. And then at Harvest, we work on storage solutions that allow a farmer with their increased inputs to um, access a little bit of a better market, take advantage of some price fluctuations, and have confidence that they're able to store it in their home. That's kind of the model in, in a nutshell. You know, you're seeing it, what each of them has said a, a real example of seeing the farmers as partners, not as beneficiaries. And that's not just a linguistic twist, 
that's really informing a way of working that I think is so fundamental to the way each of you is thinking about your work because you understand the local knowledge is important. You understand that empowerment of the farmers is a critical piece of achieving the success that we're all aspiring to. And you understand that they have the capacity not only to inform you and your work, but to inform one another in some ways that um, will be the only way that I think we will get all of this to scale ultimately, no matter how many uh, resources we invest in this. And it's, it's very powerful um, and really, really very impressive. I'm going to move on to the question of food loss because um, I think in, in pieces of what each of you may be doing, um, but very evident in some, is the question of how you protect what is produced. Obviously, insurance models protect against weather, um, but I want to drill down on some of that uh, in a more, uh, in a deeper way. And Charity, I'm going to start with you. I know that you've been concerned, and I think appropriately, that thus far, a focus on food loss has tended to be about the quantity of food which is getting wasted rather than the quality, and obviously, aflatoxin um, affects uh, storage in a very significant way. Can you talk about that issue and how we can be paying better attention to it as we start to focus more on the issue of food waste and loss? Thank you. Um, you know, I, I like to ask the audience this um, and have every respect for breeding uh, because it has an extremely important part to play and no doubt about it. But how do you reconcile with the fact that you have successfully bred for drought, for disease, you have increased yields by probably 30% or more, and the farmer, with all that produce, ends up incurring 40% of post-harvest losses. Are we really solving the problem? Really? So, so I think um, for a long time, the issues about uh, post-harvest losses were not given the attention that they deserve. But recently, uh, that is changing. Um, whether it is at government level, whether it is within uh, uh, the bigger, the wider CG uh, centers, there's a lot of focus uh, being given uh, to the issues around post-harvest losses. Policy issues uh, that are coming back. Uh, but I think one of the important things that is happening is looking at agriculture from a complete value chain approach. We're not increasing yields, but we are also looking at the end of the chain. How do we extend the shelf life uh, of this produce? How do we link our farmers to markets? Those are very important things uh, that have been raised. Aflatoxin issues, um, like I said, is both a pre-harvest uh, and a post-harvest issue. Um, there has been a lot, a lot of attention now to address the post-harvest issues by dedicating uh, resources, but also uh, developing things that address uh, the post-harvest issues. Beyond aflatoxin, you talked about uh, losses uh, in terms of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. They are very high, uh, they are, they are highly perishables. Yeah? So um, I think uh, for me, the joy is seeing that there's a lot of focus that is now being put uh, into addressing the end of the value chain, which is a post-harvest uh, losses. Yeah. Graham, can you jump in? Yeah, if I may add to that, I think it's very intriguing how we can, to the post-harvest uh, post uh, problem, actually apply the same model of integration of the science with the scaling. And it's very important that we look at post-harvest not only in volume, but also in quality, that the effect of having a good post-harvest um, management is affecting the quality of the grain. Mm -hmm. And it's in that sense, indeed, I also agree with, uh, with, with what Charity said. It's looking at the full value chain. And in order to do that, making it more traceable, making it more transparent is going to be key. If we can let travel the data 
with the grain, and that that data goes with it and it shows, was the grain socially sustainably produced? Was it well uh, reserved in post-harvest? And how is that having an impact on health? How is that having an impact on nutrition? How is that having an impact? Then we can really generate, let's say, a pool mechanism in which we first of all make sure that farmers can produce enough food, nutritious food, and healthy food for their family, and then connect them to the, to the market mechanisms and show and tell the story all the way down to the, to the consumer. And that is, I think, a key piece that we need to be thinking about uh, here in the room, how do we bring those, uh, those, uh, those things together. So it's, again, a demanding excellence in science so that also the post-harvest solution that are promoted we cannot accept that there are solutions promoted which in the end are not a real solution. And it's sometimes the difference between a very small element. And let me uh, take an example. You can get uh, storage uh, silos. And those storage silos for smallholder farmers will protect the grain from, from rats, from animals that can eat it. But if we make those same storage silos uh, airtight, at the same time, it will protect against uh, other diseases, microorganisms, fungi, because you take the air out, and then so the, the, the microorganism consumes the air, and then it basically kills itself, right? So the, that same storage solution looks exactly the same. But if we are, don't, don't make it clear, what if we are, don't assure that that solution that is coming to the farmer actually combines to the maximum what we can do and what we can bring together to a sound, excellent science, and then connect it with the outreach uh, uh, programs and mechanisms that we have, and at the same time, I'm going to repeat again, how difficult can it be to put a small sensor into that into that uh, post-harvest storage silo that measures temperature, that measures the humidity, but at the same time, that becomes a network. Because if we can come bring together those small off-field storage facilities, can bring them together in a network, and that can be connected to uh, the next stage where you can bring the grain together, and that can go to the market, then we are again generating an innovation network. And I'm more and more convinced that change is gonna come from innovation networks and the enabling tools to make that happen. Fantastic. Jump in. Uh, jumping to what he said. Uh, a lot of people are thinking about post-harvest technologies, but the issue is cost. Yeah? And I'll give an example um, of aflatoxin. Many people have advocated for rapid testing kits to address the aflatoxin problem. And many people have suggested probably we need to give farmers a rapid kit so they can test uh, for the amount of aflatoxin. The question is, this is a farmer, and by the way, aflatoxin, and, unlike other issues, does not really affect yield. It is the quality and the health implications. And it has chronic implications. So this farmer has continuously eaten uh, uh, aflatoxin contaminated food, they are not dying, yeah? they are living for long, they are not aware about the chronic implications, so they are okay. Now you're giving a testing kit to a farmer and telling them, you need to test. So okay, I'm a farmer in Makueni, a very food insecure place, uh, what do you really expect me to do with my maize when I find that it's contaminated? To throw it away? No. Yeah. I mean, I'll argue that I didn't die when I ate it. Why should I not eat, eat it now and live for many other days? Why are you telling me to throw away my grain? So the question is, we are developing technologies. Who are we targeting for the benefit of the farmer with this technology? That kit is probably better off, higher the value chain with a trader, with a manufacturer who shall aggregate the maize from the farmer test it and make a decision. In that way, they're developing a demand for safe maize and ultimately the farmer will produce that clean maize. So as we develop technologies, even for post-harvest or for any other technology, we must target the right people with these technologies. Very important. Eric, your, your model is focused on maximizing incomes and clearly this is a key component of income loss. So how do you focus on this? Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's an important question. Um, there's nothing more discouraging than having worked so hard to produce a yield and then that getting infested by weevils and, and seeing those weevils crawling around in your maze. Um, 
I think there's, there's two approaches to, the, to this challenge. On one hand, um, you can aggregate and professionalize um, and put down infrastructure. And on the other hand, you can think about what is a solution that would work for every farmer. And there are, I think, cases that both are, or one or the other is more appropriate. If you take more perishable items, I think you have to professionalize. You have to put in the infrastructure for, for item, um, crops that are more perishable. The downside of that approach um, in a smallholder context is you go from 100 eyes or 1,000 eyes or you know, hundreds of thousands of minds that are watching their, their harvest and taking care of it to one guy who's managing a silo and you, and you aggregate that risk. So he better be really good at his job because the food security of that village or that sector is, is, is in his hands. Um, and it's not easy. It takes fumigation, it takes you know, monitoring, it takes those sensors to, to make sure the moisture content is right. So I think that, that approach, um, and then there's a cost question to Charity's point on the infrastructure cost. Uh, if there's anyone here from Purdue, uh, we have a huge debt of thanks to, to Purdue. They innovated something called a PIX bag, which is something that Bram is talking about a little bit. It's a hermetically sealed bag, come in 50 kgs or 100 kgs, and uh, it's more effective than insecticide dusting or anything else in preventing uh, insects or um, other things that might spoil a harvest. And we've had... Silo, yep, which is on farm. It's on farm. Right. It's super simple. It's really easy to understand. Farmers get it. It's a high demand product in our package. Um, and we're really excited to be offering it and having a good solution that leverages uh, all of the farmers in the network. Um, and then you can think long term about those bigger investments um, and bigger infrastructure projects that connect more to a larger market or might be more appropriate in more perishable crops. So. Um, Andrew, let me ask you how and if insurance-based models could play a role in here, or whether you, you want other interventions that approach loss, such as the three that we've been, three kinds of approaches we've been talking about, or is there a role somehow? Um, all right, so as, as you asked the questions, and the others have been talking, I've been trying to think what the uh, post-harvest log, uh, post-harvest loss analog in, um, in the extensive livestock systems that we work is. Um, and I think you gave the answer um, in your question to Bram when you said, uh, in the end, uh, the, the, the aim is to maximize the income or the welfare um, uh, of the farmer. And so for, for these livestock keepers, when we think about how do we maximize their, their welfare in these systems, um, where, as I've said before, risk is pervasive, so the first thing is try to, how do you build their resilience? Um, how do you stop them from not from losing their livestock? Uh, and that is essentially the question or, or the, the problem that insurance aims, aims to solve. Although, of course, you, you listen to them and um, our model actually evolved um, through a lot of interaction um, with the farmers, uh, livestock keepers, and a request from them saying, why are you intervening after our livestock die? Um, because uh, the first type of contracts that we developed were um, what we call asset replacement contracts. So you could think of it as livestock life. Um, and these contracts paid when you know, drought had hit, livestock had died, and so the, the, the objective then was to provide you with indemnity or some payments to allow you to rebuild your herd. Um, as a result of interaction with the, you know, the pastoralists, their representatives, um, and their request that you, uh, that you try and intervene before, well, I don't know if this is the post-harvest loss, but before the loss of their livestock, we began then to develop um, what is now the, the dominant product that is being provided, which is an asset protection. And so it provides them with, uh, with indemnities in advance of loss. And they, they then use that, um, uh, they, the idea is to use that to purchase feeds um, and veterinary support, water, anything that can help them to, to, uh, to protect their livestock. But then the question is, well, in these systems, how good are the markets for feed? 
and how, how um, nutritious are those feeds and how, how costly is it to get it to them uh, because in these extensive systems, the, the, the markets are not really as well developed. You know, these are areas which are um, sparsely populated, don't have the, the road and other inf infrastructure networks in other areas. So this is part of uh, you know, the com comprehensive set of questions we have to ask when we think in the end of how do we minimize the loss in their system, how do we ensure that they can increase the, the income and welfare that they the production system that is available to them. Let me ask one last question and ask you each to answer briefly. Um, you've won this award for field research. You're very close to, and we can hear this in your answers, to the field and, and applying some extraordinary innovative um, techniques to uh, what you're doing. Year after year, we all go to conferences like this and we hear amazingly interesting ideas, and yet many of them never get to scale. So if you had a kind of magic wand and you could suggest one thing that would be necessary to take the innovations that we're seeing and really scale them in an effective way so that we could, five years from now, say, gee, we really have gotten to scale, what would it be? I didn't prepare them for this, so <laughs> I'm going to give them a minute to think. Who would like to go first? <laughs> well, I can, I can try because um, <laughs> not only myself, but uh, actually my institute, International Lifestyle Research Institute, has been thinking a lot about this. And recently, I know that um, there's been a discussion about trying to create a, um, a specialized department, um, that still, still in progress, but maybe called Impacts to Scale. Um, and the reason is because, uh, and I think, you know, uh, my fellow um, um, Board of Field Award uh, Prize um, Award winners. Might, might say this, and I know reading a lot of what Borlaug has written, there is a bit of a sacrifice for a scientist to, um, to really turn their attention to what is required um, for scale. Uh, there's, there are a lot of conversations, a lot of, as we said, interaction with the farmers, but not only them, the whole suite of uh, players that are required to really um, um, make sure that these products go to scale. You are ne negotiating with, with commercial players, you have to um, you know, learn how to uh, you know, navigate the political uh, divide. And this, this takes a lot of, uh, in the end, you're, you're almost forced to become a, uh, a um, jack of all trades. And you then might erode your mastery of, of, of one and the science you developed. And uh, you know, when, when I started in Ilri, I remember some of my colleagues will talk about uh, uh, publish or perish, and of course we must publish and we must focus on evidence-based science. But if we are not, um, if if we are turned toward, um, you know, spending a lot of time in the complex process of scale, then you lose a bit of that. And so I think what this impacts to scale, um, what is required is a is, is a new orientation or an, or a um, a new curriculum, a new type of professional. Who's, who understands the science, but whose, uh, whose incentives are oriented toward, um, toward scale. There's still a lot of debate with this within, I know, Ilri, other CG centers, um, and, and I think if we, can, if we can work on that, if we can think about um, you know, developing a new curriculum or a new type of professional system that really is, provides the right incentives to, to uh, act as the boundary, um, the boundary um, spanner between you know, really strong science and evidence, and then all the other, um, you know, the farmers and the other players that are necessary um, would be one way to go. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah, Brent? Just, uh, if you really would give me a magic wand, I, I would make human species better at uh, teamwork so that we can really um, work together in an interdisciplinary fashion. Uh, and the other thing I would do is make a scientist a little bit less afraid uh, of releasing the illusion of full control. Because if you can listen to all of these uh, interventions here, exactly what Eric said, it's about uh, distributing the risk of, uh, on, on thousands, but at the same time harvesting the innovation of the connection between those thousands, and then bringing that to, again, the thousands, which are, which are, which are the consumers and the families. And, and, and basically then it, it, all comes, uh, it all comes together. So if we could combine those, uh, those two uh, traits, I think we would, traits, I, I think we would already be uh, making a big, uh, a big jump. 
Charity, you want to jump in? Um, and really, I don't think it's very hard to give one solution. So allow me to give a couple. And uh, okay, very quickly, very quickly. You know, um, first of all, I represent a very good constituency here, which is the woman. Yeah. And uh, Kofi Annan once said, empowering a woman is one of the strongest development tools. Yeah, that's the broader context. But I want to bring something uh, to the group that we have here and ask ourselves. In this room, we are, re we are represented by politicians, we have academia, we have policymakers, we have potential leaders of tomorrow. And the question I want to pose to you, when you get money, for example, from Rockefeller, billions, millions, and you spend it, at the end of the day, what legacy have you left behind? Now, many of us uh, know Mahatma Gandhi for many right things, right? And um, he came up with something that we call the seven deadly sins of the world. I'll give you four, give us four, to think about. The first one is science without humanity. The second is knowledge without character. The third, we have CEOs in this room, is business commerce without ethics. And the fourth one, because I believe we have policymakers and, and uh, politicians, is politics without principle. You ponder that and you'll get the solution. Well, Eric? Sure, that <laughs> Um, that was beautiful. And, um, I think uh, the business without ethics is something that I would want to underline. Um, immediately when you asked the question, how, how do you go to scale, I thought about, well, you need a replicable model. You need a revenue generation um, or people paying for it. But what I underlined in the end was you need an incredible team. And Andrew, in his speech last night, talked about standing on the shoulders of a great team, and that it would have taken him 10 minutes to talk about all of the people that helped bring this livestock insurance to fruition. And I think that the real key to scale is how do you inspire a group of people? How do you work teamwork? How do you work with that group of people um, in order to reach a large number of farmers in this case? So. Business with ethics, with ethics and, and that sense is a I am good way so to inspired it. by leaving the future in the hands of this generation. Please join me in thanking the Borlaug <laughs> Field Research Award winners. Well, President Roden, th thank you for making the Borlaug Field Award possible with the $1 million contribution five years ago. I think everybody can see that it's paid off really well. These four uh, winners and uh, Didi Mukherjee, who's not here, they, they have a new place in that next generation. Thank you so much for what you've done.